As we talked about in the last lesson, there's considerable amount of debate surrounding the question of whether or not psychology can be considered a science. And what we're doing in this lesson is talk a little bit about the ways in which it can and the sort of arguments for and against uh, against the proposition that science um, and psychology, you know, that, that psychology is a science. So the first thing we've got to ask is if psychology is a science, what does it mean to call something a science? And there's a number of things that make something a science. We can argue what science looks like. We can talk about things like uh, the natural sciences, like biology, chemistry, physics, and maths. And you would argue that those qualify as a science and that they have a number of characteristics that psychology doesn't. So, for example, the first of these characteristics is objectivity. Now, by this, we mean that scientific observations ought to be objective. It means they are not subjectively determined. Okay, so it doesn't actually depend on the subject, it doesn't depend on the subject uh, whether or not we get uh, yield certain results. Okay, so in physics, for example, if one is going to um, look at the determination of uh, one's velocity, okay, uh, with regard to a particular reference frame, this is something that is objectively determined, okay. It doesn't matter who you are, if I wanted to um, work out, calculate your speed, all I would have to do is measure the distance that you travelled divided by the time it took you to travel that distance, and that will give me um, your speed in uh, physics. And it doesn't actually matter who you are uh, or anything like that. So we would say that this is objective. Within a particular reference frame, this is objective. The second characteristic of a science is the concept of control. This means that experiments can be done in a controlled environment to avoid any kind of extraneous variables. So an example of this uh, is the measurement of um, speed in a vacuum, for example, within, the, um, within physics. And the point is that we should be able to eliminate these what we call extraneous variables or externalities or externalities. And these are variables and other factors that could determine or uh, influence or bias a particular result. So uh, factors that aren't related to the experiment that can that can influence oops Daisy influence a result. Okay. So if we have an experiment and there are a number of environmental um, factors, a number of extraneous variables, variables that are outside our control that have an impact and have an influence on the on the result, then we wouldn't argue that this was a controlled experiment within controlled environments. The third factor is the concept of predictability. And this refers to the ability of a subject to yield results based off predictable circumstances. So, for example, if I wanted in physics to measure somebody's speed, okay, I can determine that speed is equal to distance divided by time. And if I know these two factors, I will always be able to tell what speed a particular person is going. Now, I can predict that using um, using the mathematics of, of, of basic mechanics, and in doing so, I can predict the results before we get uh, before we get an exam before we get an answer before we actually go out and measure somebody's speed, and this is another example of what science can do. We can um, have a kind of a certain level of predictability. We have certain um, propositions. Okay, we have certain uh, proposals about things that might happen in a particular experiment, and then we go out and we test those uh, and see whether or not we're right. Or if we're if we're right, then that's obviously a good thing. We've shown that this thing to be the case. If we're wrong, then we can um, rule out whatever prediction we um, started with as a reliable prediction within a scientific process. 
So if I can objectively determine that speed is distance divided by time, the next time I measure somebody's speed, I can predict it based off the distance divided by time. Simple as that. The final question, uh, the final fact within science is the concept of replication. And this is, refers to the ability of an experiment to um, yield similar or the same results if repeated over and over again. So again, for example, if I drop an item, if I drop an item of mass m um, and we drop it down to the ground, uh, we know that the gravity of that on Earth is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? You don't have to know this. This is a physics question, but we know that this to be the case. If I then go and, um, you know, wait a year and drop the mass m again, okay, I know that the gravity is not going to have changed. It's always going to be uh, 9.8 uh, meters per second squared when we're on Earth. So I can predict and 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 I can a predict that this is something that is going to happen that if I drop a, a mass it is going to fall to the ground at, at the at rate of um, the gravitational um, constant for earth and I can also replicate this experiment anybody can replicate this experiment they can take this object and they can drop it and they can measure the results and no matter where they are and when they did it we will be able to yield similar results the exact same thing we can say happens within chemistry. If we do a particular chemical experiment, okay, we can predict what the results are going to be. We do the experiment under controlled conditions, so there are no uh, externalities, no extraneous variables, and we can show uh, the results of this experiment. And then if we want to um, show this to be the case, we can replicate it by doing it again and yielding the same results. This is how we would say um, uh, the experiment ought to be repeated. Um, the example I've put here is the burning of magnesium within chemistry. Okay, uh, if we have, we should be able to note that um, you know magnesium is is flammable and, and creates a lot of light uh, when it is burned, and this is something that can be replicated by others under the similar circumstances. So these are the kinds of things that we would have to think about when we're asking whether or not psychology would fit into the aspect of being a science. And there is a lot of for and against on uh, both sides of this uh, equation when we're talking about whether or not psychology is a science. According to Alport, uh, psychology can be considered a science since it has the similar aims. It has the same aims of scientific inquiry. It's trying to inquire about the nature, the nature, the nature of uh, the mind, effectively, and and mental processes and behaviour, and trying to understand the mind better. Uh, these aims are also able; we are able to predict, understand, and control. Moreover, while it is questionable whether the earlier kinds of um, psychological inquiries, things like introspection, like we looked at in the last lesson, whether or not these are scientific methods, which you would probably argue that they weren't, considering they were incredibly subjective, um, they weren't exactly um, scrutinised under very um, strict control conditions, and the extent to which they can be replicated is, is, is questionable. But, so while, while things like introspection might not be considered a science, um, it might not meet the standards of um, scientific inquiry. There are more recent developments that probably can um, start to um, look at more and more like a science. For example, things like behaviorist theories, uh, cognitive biological approaches, genetic approaches. Um, these all utilize to some extent um, scientific methods and scientific equipment and, and use lots of different scientific um, processes um, to yield a number of conclusions. So that's the argument uh, for the proposition that psychology is a science. What about the kinds of arguments against it? Well, for example, there are definitely some approaches in psychology that are not particularly very scientific. And we've already mentioned the method of introspection. And as we go along we'll, uh, and look at other ones, there might be some others that you would argue aren't particularly very scientific. And introspection is a very good example of one that isn't. 
There are also methods within psychological studies that um, can show bias and we can also have subjective results. And we know that if, is, if it is not, uh, not objective, if it is not objective, then it does not, it cannot equal uh, scientific. We cannot say that it's scientific if it is subjective, so if it depends on who's doing the experiment, depends on the results that we're going to get. There are also issues when it regards to sampling and sample sizes with regard to psychology. A lot of experiments, so a lot of psychological experiments, so a lot of uh, psychological psychological experiments are done with small sample sizes. Are conducted are conducted with small sample sizes. And what this means is it's conducted with uh, a small number of, uh, of individuals. So if we were to do a psychological experiment with 5, 10, 15 people, does this, um, the kind of results that we see map um, accurately onto the population as a whole? Can we derive um, conclusions about the psychology of, of, in, of, of people in general from the very small sample issue? And this is a problem that we see in psychological studies um, in all kinds of in all kinds of fields, one of the biggest critiques that you can give a uh, a particular scientific study is if it has a small sample size, because small sample sizes um, may not reflect the uh, what could be the results if they were done over a larger um, a larger demographic. And while psychological experiments attempt to account for a number of extraneous um, variables, a number of these externalities that could um, impact the result, in some cases it is impossible to eliminate them all. We're talking about trying to study the mind. We're trying to study something that um, we do not understand its complexities. Okay, It is the most complex thing in the universe, as far as we can tell. And so therefore, it is impossible to understand all of the possible um, extraneous variables that could influence a result especially with um, especially with subjects like introspection where we have so many there are so many near infinite number of extraneous variables that it might be impossible to ever uh, eliminate them all and have a truly controlled environment to conduct psychological experiments so when it comes to the debate around whether psychology is a science, um, it, you should always note that in order to answer this question we have to first um, argue and come to a number of conclusions about what actually is a science, what things um, are required for, for one to argue that something is a science, before turning to applying those criteria to psychology.